Galatians chapter 1. I woke up this morning not feeling well again today. And uh, maybe it's the weather. Um, another pastor reached out to me this morning, wanted, us, wanted me to pray for him. Said he hadn't slept in almost three days. And uh, I mean, I know how that goes. I know what that's like. Uh, whenever you're not feeling well and, or you've been without sleep and your body's just, your mind is tired, your body's tired. And the devil plays on that. And especially when you're in the ministry and, you know, you have to be there for people and uh, do what it is that we do. And then you're not feeling well beside that. But, you know, I guess that's the part about where we're supposed to lean on God anyway. It's not supposed to be about us and it's not anything that we do that's in our ability or our strength. It all belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. So pray for uh, God's men everywhere that are lifting up his word. Uh, appreciate the pastors out in Kenya that uh, follow our ministry. And they've been so kind and they've been so gracious. They helped us out uh, as we were uh, sending Michael back out to rescue those children. Uh, it was the pastors that reached out to those kids to help them out. Taking them food, make, checking on them, make sure they were doing okay until we got there. And I just appreciate them and their ministry. Um, they're hated out there in Kenya. And it's, and it's our fault. Um, because they've been hearing from this church that you ought to read and believe the Bible. Imagine that. You know, the audacity of a church telling people they have to believe the Bible. Well, there is a false prophet uh, there's a bunch of them, but there's a big false prophet out in Kenya called Dr. Owar, and he's a nut, and he's dangerous, and he's making all these claims about raising dead people back to life, and it's all about him getting money and power from people, and, and just all kinds of wickedness, but the pastors that have decided to just stick with the Bible are being outcasted by those pastors who are aligned with this false prophet. And uh, so they got, they, they got the Seventh-day Adventists hating them. They've got the Catholic Church hating them. Then they've got these false prophet followers that are hating them as well. And uh, so if any of them are listening right now, I just want to tell you I love you and I appreciate your stand. You're not following me. Don't follow me. Follow the Word of God. Amen? And that'll make you free. Uh, Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to ask you this morning, who remembers the day that you got saved? Okay? And uh, if you don't, okay, maybe that day will be today. I, if you don't, you'll have a, maybe God will bring you a day you'll never forget. Amen? But um, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But we, we've been dealing with this issue of a false gospel and an angel from heaven bringing a false gospel. If you look in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, and I will say something that may sound weird to you, but you ought to know me by now. Get used to it, all right? Though we are an angel from heaven. Don't you think about what he's saying here. Though we are an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Back in 2 Corinthians 11, if you just turn like a page or two in your Bible, Paul said, but I fear in verse 3, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. That false gospel... It comes in many different packages, but it's the same idea. It promises immortality to sinners without Jesus Christ. That's the promise of it, is that you can bypass the cross. You don't need Jesus. You don't need the cross. You don't need salvation. You don't need to repent of your sins. You don't need it. And it just, like I said, it comes in different packages, it comes in different denominations, different forms, you know, 
150, 200 years ago, it came in a, in a certain way. 100 years later, it comes in a certain way. And nowadays, you know, you have to think, since there is no new thing under the sun, what form is this new gospel going to come in? Well, we look at technology and genetics and the advances that they're making in technology such that they're trying to connect technology not just to the human body but the human soul trying to connect computers trying to connect your mobile device who knows what we'll be talking into 10 years from now okay we didn't see this coming 30 years ago we didn't see everybody walking around we made fun of max smart on get smart for pulling a shoe off and making a phone call with his shoe remember that okay well we've way past that all right so technology and the convergence of technology into the human brain they're working on mind interfaces right now so that instead of you making a phone call you think a thought to somebody and that person receives that thought. That's, that was the occult a hundred years ago, magic, but now it's real. Now it's technology. Now they, they have the interfaces. It's very rudimentary, it's very primal, but the interface to connect the human mind to the internet, we're close to it. Okay, bringing godlike powers to mankind. Mankind's not going to be good as a god. I can tell you that right now. He's not good as a man. Okay, but that's part of it. Genetics, trying to alter everybody's genes so that you, you, whatever disease you might get, you won't get. Let's alter your DNA. Let's rewrite who you are. Let's make you free from disease. Let's let's elevate your consciousness there's that gets into the idea of religion but now it's in the idea of technology and science and um, i'm going to throw this in then i'm going to move on i'm going to give you my theory and i may have mentioned this before uh, and i don't talk about this much in in this uh in this arena in this context like sunday school Usually I reserve it for Pastor Mike online or a Watchman broadcast. But I believe that angels are going to appear in the sky. Okay? And it's not, I'm not saying anything that is not in Scripture. I think the gods are going to come down. Okay? Whether you call them gods, you call them spirits, you call them beasts, devils, UFOs, aliens, ghosts. Whatever the terminology, that's going to happen. Um, the conversation now is about UFOs because they, they asked the president, Tucker Carlson, Fox News, asked the president um, if he had been briefed on the UFO issue. And he said, yeah. And he said, I'm not going to talk about it. So whatever was said to him is a national security issue. But we already have top level CIA and Defense Department people who are, the, and the, the uh, Pentagon came out a few months ago and issued a statement saying that they're now going to accept and research what their pilots are telling them about these things that they're seeing flying around in the air that can do things that we can't do. So there is an admittance, it's called soft disclosure, there is an admittance from certain departments in the United States government that they believe that there are craft flying over the airspace of the United States of America that, we didn't, that did not originate here. They don't want to say aliens, they don't want to say UFOs, they don't want to use that terminology, but that's what they're saying and that's what they're dealing with. And again, I'm not saying anything that is out of line with Scripture. I can give you Scripture for everything I'm saying. But what I know is happening is that you have a lot of people now because of social media, because of movies, because of entertainment, 
because of the culture that we live in. You have people now who have abandoned the old religions and they're looking for a new religion and they're reaching out to new gods that we've never really known before. And these gods are these devils, these evil angels that are going to come down from the heavens and they're going to say we have a new way for mankind and we have people who are actively reaching out to these quote-unquote aliens. And when I use that term, I'm using it biblically. They're not from here. They're not from this world. Okay? And they're coming into this world. And we have people reaching out to them saying, uh, elevate our consciousness, change our DNA, cure our diseases, uh, give, us, give us machines that will... Uh, so we don't have to depend on oil and gas and we don't have to uh, tear up the environment and give us technology that will allow us to go to the stars and give us all of these things. And you have people now who have abandoned the old religions, including Christianity, to chase after these new gods that are coming. They are coming. And they're going to bring a gospel to mankind. In other words, they're going to say, we have the ability to cure all your diseases, to get rid of death. We can do that, and we're going to give that to mankind. And I think that's part of this new gospel that's coming to this world. And here's what I think. If you really want to know what I think, I'll tell you what I think. I think there are a lot of people sitting in churches right now that are going to embrace that. And they'll do it in a heartbeat. They will abandon the Bible. They will abandon the teachings from the Scriptures. They'll walk away from God. And they'll embrace this new gospel with whatever, whatever entity appears in the sky. They're going to embrace that and they're going to do it very quickly. And a lot of people that you think or they think are Christians, you're going to find out they're not. They are tares among the wheat. Okay? So, where does that leave you? And uh, I'm putting together notes for, uh, I don't know when I'm going to teach this, uh, but I got the idea yesterday. I'm putting together notes on a, on a talk I'm going to do called genocide. Genocide is when one race of people hates another race of people, another tribe, and they kill them off. Let's kill everybody from this tribe or this race or this family. And, you know, I've been looking a lot into World War II since D-Day, and that's led me into looking into how the Jews were treated in Germany. And, I mean, it was a terrible thing that happened to them, but it was genocide. It was because of their genetics that they were killed. The only reason why they were not allowed to live in Germany was because they were Jews, genetically, who they were. Now, if you're a child of the living God, your DNA is different. You know what your DNA is? This. This is the book that makes us, all right? And um, I think at some point, they're going to reach out to try to kill God's people. Has it ever happened before? Absolutely. And it's going to happen again. And my question to everybody is, would you be found guilty of being a child of the living God? Okay, that's not for me to decide. It's not our church that says that to you. That's up to you, whether or not you're actually a child of the living. Could it be proven with a test that your DNA is different than everybody else's? And God calls us to be a separate people. Uh, you're, turn to 2 Corinthians 6 while I'm on this. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You know what the word yoga means? Yoke. Yoga is a Hindu practice 
of connecting and yoking yourself with Brahma, one of their 330 million gods. How do you pray to 330 million gods? In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, Shiva, Brahma, Shakti, whatever. How do you name off 330 million gods? I don't know. But anyway, that's, that's what yoga is. Don't do yoga. Don't do it. It's a setup. It's a trap. Because that's, what the, that's literally what the word means. It's a connection between you and this God of theirs. Okay? So he says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? The yin and the yang symbol in Eastern uh, philosophies, Eastern religion, Eastern culture. Is, it's not right. It says there's a little light in all darkness and a little darkness in all light. But the Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Amen. So anyway, um, what uh, communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, verse 17, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So if you have a coexist bumper sticker on your car, scratch it off. It's, we're not coexisting. We're not getting along. We're not part of the the community or the communal or whatever. We are to be a separate family of people. Amen. And the world is going to hate us for that. Simply because we follow the word of God. So we come out from among them. I'll be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. See that sons and daughters? That's a genetic terminology that's your genes that's your dna that's who you are and once the test is done there's no denying it amen all right galatians now enough conspiracy theories let's get into fact um paul remembered the day he was saved galatians chapter 1 verse 10 i i was amazed at this I saw this years ago. Does anybody know how many times Paul talked about when he got saved in the Bible? To give you a hint, it's more than once. Okay? Do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where did he get his gospel? He got it from Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Paul hated Bible believers, hated them. Wanted, he was a zealot Jew, what we would call an ultra-Orthodox Jew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. I mean, he knew his genealogy. He was proud of his heritage. He was proud that he sat at the feet of, uh, I think it was Gamaliel, the high priest of Israel, and learned at his feet. And he was going to be a dedicated soldier for Zion and all of these pesky Christians, I'm going to go out and if I won't personally kill them, but I'll have them arrested so they can be killed. Paul was just as guilty as their blood, of their blood as anybody was. So he said, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul already had a religion it wasn't that he was an atheist he already had a religion he's like Nicodemus when Jesus met Nicodemus in John chapter 3 Nicodemus already had a religion 
So the world would say, leave him alone. He's already got his religion. Let that man alone. His religion is just as good as yours. Well, Jesus didn't believe that. If Jesus thought that, he would have let Nicodemus just live his life. If Jesus believed that about Saul, who became Paul, he would have let Saul go. But that's not what Jesus stood for. It's not what he came. He came to save men from their sins. He came to save men from their religion. Because Paul's religion was all about what he did and what he could do. And that's what it was about. And that was, you have Paul now boasting and bragging. So that's why he said in Ephesians 2, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Paul knew all about boasting in his religion. And that's what he did. So he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. He was on his way to commit genocide. He hated those people because of who they were born to. Think about that. It's like one race of men looking at another race and saying, I don't like your family. I don't like your tribe. I hate your skin color. I hate the way your eyes are. I hate the way your hair is or whatever. People can't help who they're born to, who they're born of. They don't have any control over that. So it's like hating people who don't belong to your tribe and you want to kill them. And that's what Paul did. He wanted to kill all of the people whose father was God. So he tells of his, the, the book of Acts, turn to Acts chapter 9. Actually three other places other than what he speaks about here in Galatians. Galatians, while you're turning to... Uh, Acts chapter 9, Paul said in verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So here Paul gives a little glimpse of his conversion. And he said it was by grace. When Paul teaches us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, he knew exactly what he was talking about. Jesus did not wait until Paul came to his senses and said, you know what, I think I want to follow Jesus. Jesus did not wait for that. Jesus intercepted him on his way to committing his sins. And his sins, I mean, what do you think Paul, what do you think Paul was guilty of as a sinner? Was Paul a lustful man? Did he look at women all the time? The Bible tells us Paul didn't even need a wife. So I don't think Paul sat around looking, looking at girls, looking at women all the time, lusting after them. I don't think that was it. I don't think it was money. I don't think Paul had a lust for money. I don't think he had a lust for houses. I don't think he had a lust for power. I don't think he had a lust for women or men or whatever it was. Paul's sin was a huge sin. Pride. His sin was pride. He was so proud and arrogant and he's, he's zealot. He's going to kill all of the Christians. And he's going to do it for God. Well, if God doesn't like him, let God do it. But that's what he was going to do. So in Acts chapter 9, Saul, verse 1, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. He wasn't even, Paul didn't even ask, he wasn't even commissioned by the high priest. He went and asked if he could do this. It wasn't even something that the high priest said, you know what, I'm going to kill me some Christians in Damascus. Uh, who can we get? Can we get Saul? Yeah, let's use Saul. That's not what happened. It was Saul's idea. So he went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And that's one of the things that I've learned in this world is that when it comes to hate, it doesn't matter if the people that you hate are men, women, or children. I was watching part of the trial of Adolf Eichmann. He was 
one of Hitler's number one guys. He's the one that organized dispersing the Jews to the concentration camps. And one of the, they had testimony that took them, man, I don't know how many months it took them to try Adolf Eichmann. Had like 110 different court sessions. But in part of the testimony, at Eichmann's command, they put Jews inside this trench, lined them all up there, standing already on dead bodies. And they were all going to be shot. And then they would fall there in the trench and they would just cover them up. And this woman was holding a baby, Jewish woman. She didn't want the baby killed. She would plead for the baby's life. If you're going to kill me, fine, save my child. So she tossed the baby over to one of the Nazi guards. He fired two bullets in her, and he just tore that child in half, just like that. How do you do that? How do you do that? That's, that's, the, depra that's the depraved heart of man. Yeah, there were devils there. There's no doubt. But men are guilty of horrendous evils. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay? Paul, Paul says, I don't care if it's men or women. I don't care. Um, Hitler's idea against the Jews was the old people, yeah, we'll kill them, but we got to kill all the children. If we don't get those children, we're wasting our time. I'm just telling you how devil people think. So anyway, might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. And suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. He saw a UFO. Unidentified object. He saw a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? And why did Jesus say it that way? Because remember in Matthew 25, Jesus said, the shepherd is going to divide up the people, the sheep and the goats. And the goats are those who, when I was sick, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. When I, when I was in need, you didn't give me anything. And they'll say, you know, when, when was it that we didn't do this? And he said, in as much as you have not done it to the least of my brethren, you have not done it unto me. Jesus said, the least of his brethren. That means the most insignificant Christian that you could ever think of someone who's not loud someone who doesn't stand up and pray some, someone who doesn't testify someone who who you think doesn't do anything but they're saved and jesus said when you offend the least of my brethren you've done that unto me he listen to me now your savior always takes it personally when you're persecuted when you're maligned when you're lied about when you're tormented by others your savior always takes it personally because you are his body literally you're his body and so uh verse five he said who art thou lord I think he just answered his own question. Who art thou? Lord. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And what he means by that, think of things in the Bible that sting. Sting of death. The scorpions that we see in Revelation chapter 9. Serpents fangs. All of those prickly things in the Bible. Thorns. It's hard for you to kick against those, Paul. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? 
And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now, that's a long way time to go without eating or drinking. Okay? But then, of course, Paul then is accepted when he, once he gets to the very people. The, can you think about this? This is, this is God's people. The very people that he hated are the ones who took him in. And I know all about this. I've told this story, this testimony many times. But back in the day... I went to a denominational meeting in North Carolina, National Association meeting, and I heard that they were going to have a conference in a little side conference room dealing with the King James Bible issue. So I thought, I want to go and hear what kind of ignorance these people put out. Now, at the time, at the time, I was on the other side. So I listened to the esteemed Greek professor of Free Will Baptist Bible College, Dr. Robert E. Piccarilli, Dr. Piccarilli. And I heard him when he spoke, and I'm going, yeah, you tell him. Because one of the things he said was, if you say you believe the King James Bible, my question to you is, which King James Bible do you believe? Do you believe the 1611 King James Bible? Or do you believe the 1620 King James Bible? Or do you believe the 1689 King James Bible or the 1720 King James Bible? Or, in other words, what he was trying to sell us was that the King James Bible that came out in 1611 was not the same Bible that we're holding in our hands right now. Now, out in the foyer here is a reprint of the 1611 King James Bible. If you'll go out, don't do it now, if you'll go out, pick, a, pick your favorite chapter in the Bible and turn there in that book and read it. You'll see that it is word for word, King James Bible. But see, I, I wanted to believe him at the time, and I did. And I went, yeah, you guys, because I hated King James people. To me, they were all arrogant. To me, they were all hypocritical. They were all legalists. And I just, and I would watch these men with tears in their eyes, Wayne, stand and tell of what God has done with them and their church and their ministry in this country and so on with the King James. And, you know, why are you attacking it? And I just laughed. I mocked these guys, hated them. And God made me one of them. And I'm so glad He did. Because he lied. He lied through his teeth when he said all the King James Bibles are different. We don't have the 1611 anymore. It's a different version. Now what you'll see out there is difference in spelling. But we're not saved by spelling. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the words are spelled different, but if I went out there and grabbed that Bible and came in here and read it to you, you wouldn't be able to hear the difference. There was a study done. I have the document uh, back in 1850. The American Bible Society actually looked at the issue of had the Bible been changed since 1611. Now in 1850, all that was in the English world was the King James Bible. But apparently there must have been a question arise that the Bible had been altered since its first printing in 1611. So the American Bible Society established a commission to look into the issue. And here was their report. They said, other than typographical errors, and you got to remember, they're not using computers back then, a guy is reading handwritten script from his copy, and he's putting letters on a plate backwards. Okay? Because you've got to 
put the plate then down on the paper. You had to roll ink over it, put it on paper. And then you have the letters on the paper. So he's doing all this backwards. And he made mistakes in printing these pages. Some of the words were altered. Those were corrected then. And we're not talking about any significant thing. There is one version. It's called the adultery Bible. Because it says in Exodus 20, thou shalt commit adultery. That is a big misprint. Big misprint. So they had to correct that. But the commission said, other than spelling and typographical errors, and they actually went into, they listed page after page of what you could see was obvious misprints, typo errors, where they put the wrong word in, or they, they left one out or whatever. So they listed all of those, and they said, here's the difference. But other than that, the Bible that we're reading now is the same Bible they had in 1611. Exact same one. So, I, I mean, I'm just throwing that in because that was the same thing that God did with me, God did with Paul. And maybe, maybe even you, the same thing God did with you. Whereas before, you may have hated Christians, you may have hated church, may have hated preachers. Didn't want anything to do with them. Bunch of do-good hypocrites and preachers always telling me I can't do this and I can't do that. While well, he goes out and does it. And your mind may have been full of bitterness and hatred against God's people. And yet God made you one of them. God's got a sense of humor, does he not? Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 22. I forgot my watch. Somebody will have to tie a rope to me and drag me off of here. Acts chapter 22. That was, that was, uh, now Luke is the one who writes the book of Acts. So now this is Luke's account. Now we're going to have Paul tell it. Acts 22, verse 1. Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And now they heard that he spoke in, in the Hebrew tongue to them, and they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as you all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound in Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh in Damas to Damascus about noon, something there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, arise and go into Damascus, and there shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which were dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, listen to that, Brother Saul. Brother Saul, receive thy sight. In the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Do you look at that? That Paul was to be a witness. Look in Acts chapter 26. Same testimony. Same testimony. You've got... Three different occurrences of Paul's testimony. I'm not going to read all this. Three different occurrences of Paul's testimony. One occurrence in the book of Galatians of Paul telling. And what you get a picture of is everywhere Paul went. He went telling about how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And I'm saying to you this morning. If God has saved you, you have a testimony. When you're, on the, when you're in the courtroom and they put you on a stand... They only want you to tell what it is that you know. Not what you think or not what you, you know, you believe or your philosophies or, or your theories or anything like that. No, tell what you know. Do not be ashamed, people, to tell people what God did to you on the road to Damascus. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't be ashamed to tell people. Because you know what? How many of you 
you can see where Paul was. You hated church. And yet God made you one. Raise your hand. Look at you. That's your testimony. And see, that speaks to people. Because there's others out there that are just like you were. Unbelievers. Hated God. Hated the church. Hated preachers. Hated the Bible. And like instantly, you fell in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for meeting us on the road to Damascus. Thank you, God, for calling us. And Father, that when you did it, we were not good. We were not doing right. The day, Father, that you set us aside and sanctified us and purified us and cleansed us, God, we were yet sinners. You didn't save righteous people. You saved wicked people. God, thank you for meeting us on the road to our own destruction. Thank you, God, for not turning us over to a reprobate mind. Thank you, God, for pulling us out of religion, out of false religions, and giving us that pure religion from heaven. Father, teach us how to love even our enemies. We can only do that by the grace that you give us, Father. We love you. We thank you, dear God, for this good word. We ask your blessings on it. We thank you, God, for saving Paul. Because if you can save Paul, you can save anybody. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.